So now we're going to bring a group of uh, folks up here, and uh, they're going to talk about something called the blockchain. Gary Cookhorn has spent half his career in the investment world, currently with Fortress Investment Group. Among other things, he served as a divisional CFO at the United Nations and as head of loan services at the World Bank. Allison Davis is an advisor to Fifth Era and is a global strategist, finance professional, and governance expert. Allison served on a number of boards and was CFO of Barclays Global Investors, now BlackRock. Matthew Mer Lemerle is the managing partner of Fifth Era. He is an expert on digitization and technology transformations. He's advised governments and leading companies on technology-related issues. Prior to Fifth Era, he was a partner in Booz & Company, leading their West Coast communications, media, and technology practice. Please welcome Gary Cookhorn, Allison Davis, and Matthew Lemerle. So, change of topic. So, question for all of you. If you think of the world's most valuable companies, Exxon, Walmart, like big global companies, how many of the top five most valuable companies are West Coast-based technology companies? Show of hands, who thinks one? Who thinks two? Quite a few of you. Who thinks three? Now the group, who thinks four? Who thinks five? Okay, well the answer is five, five. So Apple, Alphabet, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Microsoft are all West Coast based companies and they are the world's most valuable companies. So all of us are very privileged to be living here in the Bay Area in this time frame. We're at the very epicenter of global innovation. And so many of the technologies that are changing the way that humans exist on the planet are being developed and scaled right here in our neighborhood. Um, financial services, which we're going to talk about next, is the biggest industry in the U.S. It's the top three industry globally, and it affects all of us. And one of the most exciting breakthroughs in the, um, since the Internet in financial services, and arguably even in the... Um, last you know 50 years is the development of blockchain technology so that's what we're going to talk about tonight in 2008 and the mysterious figure no one still knows who he is called satoshi nakamoto it could even be several people wrote this breakthrough white paper on bitcoin and the blockchain which solved this problem of how you transfer value not just data digitally on the internet if I have three dollars here, I could give uh, three people a dollar. Here, come take it, come take your dollar. And it would be clear that I no longer had the dollar and you have the dollar. But on the internet, you can't do that. If I send you a photograph, I still have the photograph, you have the photograph. Who owns the photograph? Um, so anyway, this was the big breakthrough. You should all read the white paper. It's very short. It's like, you know, a few pages long. So we're going to... The three of us are all investors in blockchain technologies, and we're going to try and give you a quick burst on why we are all so excited about it. So to get started, uh, Gary, in very simple layman terms, what is blockchain technology and how does it relate to Bitcoin? Thank you. Uh, so um, blockchain technology, um, as Alison uh, intimated, is a relatively new uh, potentially powerfully disruptive technology that can disintermediate the need for us to use a trusted third party, um, third party like banks, for example. Um, and when Satoshi Nakamoto came out with his paper, he referred to this distributed public secure ledger, which is a, a lot of words I know, but distributed, basically, anyone can have one. Public, anyone can, can see it. Um, secure, it's backed by very strong cryptography. Um, and it's a, it's a ledger. It's basically a database. And one of the ways to think about it is just, you know, its simplest form, Excel spreadsheet, two columns. One column describes you as an ID. It's some random looking string of uh, alphanumerics. And the other column will represent 
an item of value, number one, number two, any number that there is. And only you have the power to change what's in that cell. And you can pass this Excel spreadsheet, if you like, around the world, and it's kept in sync by a bunch of different computers and miners, and no one has the power to change that, what's in that cell but you yourself. So um, essentially, that is what um, uh, the blockchain is. And it relates to Bitcoin because Bitcoin rides on that, that blockchain. Um, and you know, it, it, one way to think about it is that you know, uh, rock, silver, gold, salt, copper, nickel, paper, they've all been used as money in the past. Uh, and today we're starting to use this technology as a digital way to move money around. Fantastic. Matthew, would you add anything to that? No. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Question two then for Matthew. Uh, Matthew, I think over a billion dollars of investor money is flowing into blockchain technologies. It's more than flowed into the internet at a similar stage in its development. So Matthew, why are banks and venture capitalists so excited about this space? Thanks, Alison. So um, I actually run the world's largest angel group, Kretsu Forum, and we tend to invest in frontier technologies, as do, as do most VCs. And what that basically means is whether it be virtual reality and entertainment, whether it be new coding platforms and tools like Unity and programming, whether it be new scientific breakthroughs that are impacting face lice, uh, the new technologies that impact the old industries are viewed as where the most disruption and value creation is likely to occur. So most investors seek out the leading edge of technology, and especially technologies, as you've both already said, that will impact uh, large industries in fundamental ways. So that's why investors do it. What the second half of your question is why do you established financial institutions take blockchain seriously? Everyone in this room who's a Wells Fargo customer got hacked at the beginning of this year. Your information is now available to other bad actors. If you have a Yahoo email account, you were hacked a couple of years ago and your information is in the public domain. If you were an ATM user in Dublin and in Ireland, uh, the system crashed and you couldn't get money out of your bank. These sort of changes, these sort of risks that are occurring are because the banking and financial institution infrastructure is getting old. We created it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and then we built on it, built on it, built on it, and the legacy infrastructure of large financial institutions is getting to the end of its life. It has to be replaced, and big banks and insurance companies, amongst others, believe blockchain can be a central piece of that new technology. Nice job. So, Gary, uh, can you give a few examples of use cases for blockchain technology that will bring this to life a bit for our audience? Uh, sure. So probably the uh, best and biggest example of use of blockchain technology is Bitcoin itself. Um, and inside that area, there is a subset called remittances, which uh, shows a lot of potential for use of blockchain technology. And remittances, for those who don't know, it's when you know someone sends usually relatively small amounts of money to you know back to their family and I don't know wherever in the world it, it may be. Today, that industry is dominated by MoneyGram, Western Union, etc. It's a large uh, industry, um, probably what five, six hundred billion a year um, of money flows through that industry, and the fee that these intermediaries take on each transaction is often ten percent or, or more. Bitcoin has the potential to revolutionise that and do it fast, cheap, and in a very secure way. But there are many other examples. Um, uh, there are other digital currencies, for example, Ripple, Ethereum, Litecoin, etc. There are also fiat currencies, what we refer to as you know, yeah, dollar bills, etc., that some governments have thought about putting on the blockchain. Um, notaries uh, may be disintermediated in the future because simply if you have a trusted intermediary, you don't need a notary to notarize. Uh, certain facts. There are so many others. Um, the stock exchanges and the settlements process is, is one. Um, uh, vehicle registration, uh, land titles, um, voting. Why do you need to fill out all that paperwork and then go to a room to do it when in the future you may be able to use blockchain technology to vote? 
I just want to uh, double down on one of your examples, which is the home titles. Um, I had a very painful experience. I'm sure many of you did have too. We wanted to do some work in our garden here in Tiburon. I went down to get the permit. They told me I needed to know, was my title clear? Were there any rights of way or passages or other things that would stop me doing the work in my garden? I said, I don't know. How would I find out? They say, go to um, the civic center, pay some money, and they'll do a search. You go, you pay the money, they go behind, they come back with a big wadge of printouts, half of which are illegible. You say, where did those come from? They looked at microfiche. So you sort of say, really? You had to look at microfiche to figure out what my title looks like? You have to pay a lot of money for this process. It's not just that they haven't digitized it, it's that as the title got created and annotated, it wasn't continuously updated. The distributed ledger of blockchain means that every change to a title would be automatically updated, always available in real time, anywhere, anyhow, by anyone. And that's the sort of thing we're trying to move towards. We don't need the people to search here in Tiburon, and we certainly don't need the people at the Civic Center to go to microfiche. Thank you, Matthew. So in wrapping up, um, do you each want to give a few thoughts into how the world might be different in 10 years' time as a result of blockchain technology? Gary. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. So, um, you know, we're very early in the evolution of, of blockchain, and many people liken it to the internet when it started. It took many years before there was a, a Google, um, Yahoo, Netflix, etc. And we're, we're just at the beginning of that hockey curve uh, today. Looking down the road, um, I'd imagine that a lot of the things that I just mentioned, will, we will be doing electronically, um, not looking at microfiches, but you know, basically going online in order to assure we have title to a certain property. Uh, voting, for example, I'd imagine that we will be doing that electronically in the future. Uh, vehicle registration, all of those things, I think, will, will come to pass. Since for the purposes of tonight, Gary's greed and I'm fear, I'm going to give you the bad side. So in the absence of new technologies that can cope with this legacy infrastructure problem in financial services globally, I think in 10 years' time, not only do we have a lot more hacks, our information is insecure, bad agents have access to our capital and allow and are able to, to extract it from us in all sorts of creative ways, but even more fundamentally, bad actors can close down the payment system of America or other countries, and we, have, we can be held uh, hostage to essentially cyber terrorism. I give that as an example, but the fundamental need is for us to have much smarter technologies to support the digital economy, and the digital economy is certainly our future. I would, I, I would, uh, I would add, though, another sort of future use cases uh, in the Internet of Things, connected devices, with digital currency and the blockchain, devices and machines can actually earn money, have resources, have bank accounts, hire people, hire other machines to work for them. So a lot of very interesting use cases around that that are causing people to think about the tipping point of uh, computer power overtaking humanity. But anyway, that's it. As you've heard, we're very excited. And... Uh, we think the blockchain is a critical component of the future. Um, there'll be lots of winners and losers, lots of immense fortunes made and lost. And thanks for listening. And all of us are happy to talk about this later if any of you would like to.